thanks very much for joining me um, this evening. It, it really does mean a lot to me to uh, to be invited to speak to you this evening, especially on um, such an auspicious day as the 25th, um, which obviously, as you know, is a, a big day for us. But it, it, it's a really sort of quite a personal day for me because um, this is uh, the day that um, the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles, the 5th Battalion Royal Scots, uh, joined the Gallipoli campaign, uh, the only territorial infantry uh, to do so. So what I'll be talking about over uh, the next wee while is the forgotten story of Edinburgh's weekend warriors, the so-called lads of the Lothians, um, Lothian being uh, the, the, the county that they were from. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the 4th, 5th and 7th Royal Scots, um, who were territorials, they were only intended uh, for home defence, but they found themselves propelled into the ill-starred Gallipoli campaign. And indeed, once there, uh, they sustained terrible casualties, but never once failed in their duty to carry their objectives. Uh, the 28th of June, uh, the Battle of Gully Ravine, uh, has now long passed out of folk memory here in Edinburgh. And it's often treated as a bit of a footnote in most campaign histories, but the losses sustained on that day made it uh, a day of deep mourning here in Old Reeky, uh, the, the local nickname uh, for Edinburgh. And indeed, things were so bad that a children's book, Lads of the Lothians, where I've uh, uh, borrowed the title from uh, for tonight's talk, this was actually written in 1920. And even though it's a children's book, it's heavily based on eyewitness accounts. And I, I think the idea here was to try and help many Edinburgh children come to terms with why their father had been replaced with three medals and a bronze plaque above the fireplace uh, in many cases. So you might sort of say, well, this is a bit of an obscure story. Why bother digging up the past? Well, the opinion of the Padre of the Fourth Royal Scots, uh, Queen's Edinburgh Rifles, to me is very instructive. Uh, Major William Ewing MC states in his book, Gallipoli to Baghdad, you may well have heard of it. Uh, his opinion is this, and I quote, it ought to be told again and again until it's every feature of splendor and sacrifice is imprinted indelibly on the heart and mind of our people. And I hope uh, that at the end of this talk, uh, you'll agree with him uh, as I do. So there's a, a William Ewing himself. Um, the units that fought at Gallipoli as part of the territorial force had their roots in the mid-Victorian volunteer movement, uh, and they were founded in 1859. The Queen's Edinburgh Rifles settled on a dark uniform, and as a result of that became known as the Edinburgh Blacks. Other volunteer units in the town uh, knew them as the BBBs, and if you'll excuse my French, that stood for the Black Button Bastards. Uh, however, uh, by 1908, uh, the QER, the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles, was a very well-established unit uh, with a lot of cash in it, uh, so much so that they were actually producing these things that you see here, their own glossy recruitment postcards that you could send uh, to likely recruits. So in that year, in 1908, uh, they were embodied as part of the new territorial force and became the 4th and 5th Battalions of the Royal Scots. Although confusingly uh, for the researcher, they still refer to themselves as the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles, the Queen's, the Rifles, and the Edinburgh Blacks. So on joining the QER, one was joining an elite club, and pre-war it actually cost a pound uh, to join uh, the regiment here, and candidates had to be co-opted by two long-standing members to keep the men in the battalions of the right sort. And this is the membership card here of George Brown, uh, who served in Gallipoli. Uh, it's signed by Major Simpson of the Fourth. And you could be forgiven with its clubby atmosphere for thinking that the QER was a bit of a, a posh boys club with a few shooting contests thrown in. But that was actually far from the case. Uh, the QER was very well organized and run and had a, a reputation for musketry that few regular battalions could actually match. What you see here is the shooting uh, calendar of H Company of the 5th Battalion. And all shooting took place on uh, in a place called Hunter's Bog on Arthur's Seat. If you've ever been to Edinburgh, you know the, the big hill on a, sort of like the eastern side of the town. And if you walk through Hunter's Bog to this day, you can still pick up 
uh, stray bullets there. The ground is still littered uh, with rifle bullets uh, from the QER. All of the men uh, that you see uh, in the calendar there, they all fought uh, in Gallipoli. And uh, you'll see the name of uh, Monty Smith, uh, who was uh, a medical student. Uh, that's him there on uh, the, the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, in the middle, uh, you see Johnny Aitchison, uh, who was a trainee banker. And uh, on the far side there is William Milne, who was a printer and an amateur boxer. Um, he looks like one. Uh, and he was described as being the hardest man in the battalion. So it's actually abundantly clear that most members of the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles took their training very seriously uh, indeed. And uh, they had about 2,500 men on the books uh, by 1914. They were at about 80% of their establishment, which for a TF unit, competing with the indifference of employers, the outright hostility of trade unions was actually extremely good. About 10% of uh, the members had, unta had uh, undertaken the imperial service obligation. And thus they were they were getting on uh, for being about as well trained as the regulars. Those lads with the, the wee um, silver badge on the, on the right side of the jacket. As might be expected uh, in Edinburgh, you know, it's very posh, darling, in certain areas, um, the unit was officered and manned by the town's middle class, privately educated professionals. And as such, they had, as we'll see in battle, an unusually high level of education, ability and general acumen. Um, Reverend Ewing uh, illumines the issue uh, from Gallipoli uh, to Baghdad. He says, men from the pulpits, the college, the bar, the exchange, rub shoulders with those from the shop and the warehouse, clerks, railwaymen, policemen, and ne'er-do-wells from the streets. These men face the common dangers, perform the ordinary tasks, endure without grousing the inevitable hardships of trench warfare in a spirit of extraordinary good fellowship. In fairness, though, it's true that they were assisted by very able regulars, uh, such as the adjutant of the Fifth Royal Scots, uh, Captain William Hepburn of the Second C4. Uh, you see him there on uh, the left-hand side, and their quartermaster, William Steele, uh, a man with over a quarter century experience in the ranks of the regular Royal Scots. And both of these men did a huge amount to professionalize the Fifth Battalion. That said, it also speaks uh, much of the Fifth Royal Scots that Hepburn actually fought to remain with the QER rather than returning to his regiment on the outbreak of war. Without a doubt, the highlight of the territorial year was the 15-day annual camp, which was held in Stobbs uh, in the Scottish borders in 1914. It actually opened on the very day that Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo, and um, sort of spookily, a year to the day later, hundreds of the terriers uh, that were training at Stobbs uh, will be killed or maimed in the charge at Gully Ravine. Uh, on a purely logistical level, there was a huge amount of organisation that went into these camps and quartering uh, and sanitary work. And the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles made real efforts to make these camps of what would now be called realistic training value even though the camp was rather embarrassingly called off on the 4th of August, the day that war broke out due to wet weather. <laughs> Having plenty of boots on the ground uh, meant that they were actually able to put together quite useful large-scale schemes of attack and defence over huge areas of the borders. And having a good whack of private cash, it's probably fair to say that these camps delivered a better standard of training than most pre-war TF battalions received. For example, uh, all Royal Scots Territorials had purchased their own 1908 uh, webbing before the war. You see Private Sid Bent there in his, uh, in his uh, equipment. He was badly wounded on uh, the 28th of June. A look at the programmes of what the, um, the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles were doing at Stobbs that year reveals 12-hour days with wall-to-wall -wall theoretical lectures in the evenings from everything from night attacks uh, to the use of machometers. And the Edinburgh Evening Dispatch of the 22nd of July lets us know a little more. 
Uh, here's the Colonel of the Fifth, uh, James Wilson. Uh, it reported the Fifth Royal Scots, Queen's Edinburgh, were out late last night under Colonel JTR Wilson when they received useful instructions in night attack manoeuvres, discipline and caution. They had to take their bearings by the stars and were instructed in the passing of orders, etc., in a quiet and stealthy manner as on the field near an enemy's lines. Today, the battalion paraded again under Colonel Wilson and proceeded in the direction of Pencrise, where they were engaged in entrenchment work. The scouts and intercommunication sections carried out a separate program under Captain and Adjutant Hepburn. So even though they couldn't have known it, that night training there would be vital on two occasions at least in Gallipoli. And it was actually in camp that year that the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles received the victory uh, or received news of the victory of Sergeant George Dewar at Bisley, who won the King's Prize and £250, and that's about £23,000 today. The fact that uh, a toy salesman from the Edinburgh suburb of Collington was uh, the top shot in the empire provides ample evidence, really, of the, uh, the hard graft that the, Queen, uh, that the Queen's Edinburgh Rifles put in on their private range. That said, uh, there was a lot of fun to be had. Uh, there were many young recruits uh, in the battalion who were looked after by dads, older brothers, etc. And the spirit of the battalion and the adventure that these young lads um, is certainly typified by young George Downey, who actually fought in Gallipoli at the age of 17. Uh, as you can see there, he was a piper and a signaller, and he was actually allowed to take his own motorbike to camp and then to Gallipoli to aid unit communications. So on the outbreak of war, uh, the Royal Scots territories were quickly strung about uh, along the coast of the Lothians in their pre-allocated defensive positions. As I said, they were only intended uh, for home defence. However, all the battalions enthusiastically volunteered for overseas service. The 5th actually telegrammed to the war office on the day that war broke out to put themselves forward to go overseas. The 4th, uh, the 4th Battalion managed to fill their Imperial Service Battalion first. They actually took in a hefty draft of lads from the 6th Battalion Royal Scots. But all the way through, the 7th Leith Battalion attracted more recruits. We can really sense the frustration of uh, these lads partially trained in that first winter of war, because obviously they thought that because they volunteered, they'd be sent overseas pretty quickly not the case they were preparing furiously but were being fed nothing but tidbits of gossip on potential deployments to keep them going and of course all the time these lads thought that they were being sent to france you can see on the left of the screen there the postcards uh, from 1914 it's the christmas card of the fifth royal scots uh, that was designed by the gentleman that you see on the screen there, uh, Lieutenant Walter Hislop, who was an incredibly talented artist uh, in the Royal Scottish Academy. And we can see our Edinburgh Terrier gazing longingly out to sea, presumably to France, and willing himself to be in the fight. There was, therefore, a real sense of what can only be called disbelief and pride that the 5th Battalion were, in early March 1915, attached to the 29th Regular Division. And this was a huge honour uh, for these Edinburgh Territorials. Uh, Captain Arthur Muir um, records the moment that they were told that they were, they were being sent to the 29th. And uh, I mean, I am... Um, informed by one of Captain Muir's uh, relatives that the, the opening paragraph of his book is the only book that's ever been published in the English language, which starts with the following words. Tinkle, 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 ting, ting, went the telephone. The acting adjutant picked up the receiver. Hello? Is that the 5th Battalion Royal Scots? Yes, sir. Headquarters Scottish Command talking. Yes, sir. You are to move in 48 hours to Leamington to link up with the 29th Division. Yes, sir. At last, it had come. So this, in fairness, provoked a bit of a crisis in the fifth. Would these middle-class amateurs be able to hack it with hardened professionals, with officers potentially of a higher social class than them? Well, if the fifth had hoped for a grand send-off, they were to be so disappointed, really. They were actually hustled onto waiting trains, at the sidings in Portobello, uh, which is sort of a, a northern suburb of Edinburgh, 
and very few of the men were able to wish any of their loved ones goodbye. Indeed, two officers uh, were transferred from the reserve to the service battalion with just six hours notice. This caused something of uh, a scandal, so much so that the Weekly Scotsman still recalled the event in 1938. You actually see the uh, the train ticket for, for the fifth to take them from Portobello uh, to Leamington there. The Weekly Scotsman said, those of, uh, who of those surviving that took part will ever forget the last hectic march, almost at the double, when the battalion in two detachments served uh, surged across the all too short stretch of road from the marine gardens to the sidings, and relatives eagerly scanned the ranks as they passed under the few flickering street lamps in the hope of recognizing and clinging desperately to their dear ones in a last brief farewell. So thus far, there'd been no official word on where the 5th and indeed the 29th Division were heading. But as they proceeded to Leamington Spa and thence to Avonmouth on you know, the west of England, it was becoming a little bit more apparent that they weren't intended for France. Settling into the 29th Division, their final training was frenzied. In an interesting innovation, Colonel Wilson, uh, who you saw before, redesignated the four companies that had previously been A, B, C, and D uh, to W, X, Y, and Z, as uh, it was thought that they would be more intelligible verbally uh, in the heat of battle. And uh, Captain uh, John Wilson, uh, who you see the uh, the white-haired uh, officer sitting in the centre of the uh, of the photo there. This is at the Marine Gardens in Portobello, where they were quartered, which is a big pleasure ground. Um, Captain John Wilson and the newly uh, labelled Z Company gives us a really interesting insight into this period. Uh, he wrote to his wife, "The Fifth Royal Scots are the only territorial regiment here in the division. All the others are regular and appear well set up, older men. Our men look young." We are to be inspected by His Majesty King George and perhaps Lord Kitchener. By we, I mean the brigade. The two other brigades forming part of the division will also be inspected tomorrow, but not at the same time. So the 5th were indeed duly inspected by the King, and Captain Wilson noted with evident satisfaction that many of the regulars fell out on the march to the parade, but only two from the 5th did, and none from his company. He was very pleased with that. And it was here that we get a really fascinating exchange as related uh, by uh, the wife of Colonel Wilson uh, to our diarist John here. And he says, I had a call today from Mrs. Wilson. She was telling us that King George asked Colonel Wilson if he was pleased where we were going. So Colonel W says, well, yes, we've had hints, but we've not been told yet. So the King, so King George says, oh, well, it begins with a D. So that means the Dardanelles. So it was literally at that moment that it was confirmed by the king uh, where, the, uh, where the fifth were going. So the battalion proceeded to Alexandria for acclimatization and final training. And though busy, it must have been a thoroughly fascinating time for these men of the fifths, many of whom wouldn't have been further than Portobello Beach or at a stretch Blackpool. Uh, contemporary accounts of this period at uh, Mustafa Pasha camp a pretty scant. It gives you a real idea of how you know busy they were. Well, on the 23rd of April, John Wilson wrote home telling his wife that they expected to move for the objective, and I quote, tonight or within 24 hours. And it was on the 21st of April that the battalion and indeed the 29th Division um, received Lieutenant General Hunter Weston's message commending them to do their duty, despite the fact, and this is really cheerful, that they were about to face, and I quote, hardships, privations, thirst, heavy losses by bullets, by shells, by mines, and by drowning. Uh, Captain Douglas Lindsay, a uh, senior company commander in the 5th, then uh, a business partner of Colonel Wilson, managed to di uh, dash off a missive home from their final concentration point in Alexandria um, and you know, just before they went uh, over to Lemnos, uh, which struck a more cheery and jaunty note. And I'll quote it here. He says, just a few lines as we are very near the fighting place now, only about 40 miles off. We expect to sail any moment to start operations. From what I can gather, landing will be difficult and full of risk, but it should be exciting, and more especially if the Turks show any resistance. 
We've no idea where we are going to land. We only arrived at this place this morning and a large number of ships are congregated here. You can depend that when we do start, we will be all over them in a very few days as the crowd of men here are all old trained soldiers of the very best quality who will soon wipe everything that comes before them off the face of the earth. Yeah, <laughs> by this point, some clarity had emerged. The fifth, obviously, is the only territorial infantry were to disembark on the peninsula last as the reserve of 88 Brigade 29th Division. Two companies plus the battalion machine guns would be landed at about 9 a.m. So obviously quite a while after the initial landings, the other two companies would act as lines of communication troops and general dogs bodies. So leaving Lemnos uh, at uh, 3.30 p.m., they transshipped onto uh, the transport Dongola and from there onto the River Clyde. And earlier the next morning, uh, Lance Corporal John Goat of the machine gun section, as well as Captain Lindsay, uh, found themselves in the forecastle of the River Clyde as they steamed in uh, to the landing beach. As one officer of the 5th grimly noticed uh, to himself, we have properly left ourselves into it. Despite the gravity of the moment, Douglas Lindsay, seemingly an incurable optimist, scribbled in his diary, all quiet, we are about to land unopposed. John Goat described the scenes a few minutes later in his diary. Turk shelled us from both European and Asiatic sides, shells falling all around us, but none hit the transport. Watch the landing by the Fusilier Brigade. Ghastly, but an, entra uh, an entrancing sight. Could see them being mowed down by Turks rifle and machine gun fire. Several boats capsized at the barbed wire entanglement, which Turks had placed under the sea. Occupants drowned. Many boats drifted out to sea with all of their occupants killed. Another unnamed member of uh, the machine gun section, a Lance Corporal, wrote home describing them the uh, battalion's first moments in Gallipoli. We landed about midday after the brunt of the forcing was over and a few bullets greeted us, but not many. We received our first great shock when we filed along the shore and passed the bodies of those who had fallen in the storming. We gazed up at the cliffs that circled this small strip of sand and we wondered how anyone could have survived the withering fire of the machine guns and rifles from these commanding positions. John Goat summated the day as the queerest Sunday I ever spent. It's certainly apparent that there was a profound feeling of shock and a certain level of disorganization pervading the rather perilous beachheads in the days after the landing. Uh, days which were spent reorganizing and consolidating instead of pushing on as planned. The, the commanding soap server, Ashi Barber, which were to have fallen into the British hands on the first morning of the assault, still lay in enemy territory. And whilst British nerves steadied, Ottoman defenses solidified. Uh, despite this, John Goat was able to write several lengthy diary entries, and Walter Hislop, who we saw before, was able to sketch the scene at W Beach, uh, the sketch that you see here. One might have thought that as a junior sub, you know, he and everybody else might have been a bit busier. That said, uh, Colonel Wilson, who you, you see sitting at the, uh, uh, in the center of the picture there, he wasn't idle, and having observed the terrible casualties amongst the officers, uh, he uh, uh, immediately ordered all his subordinates to adopt other ranks' tunics, webbing, rifles, in an attempt to make them less conspicuous. And this drew sort of like quite a few snippy um, comments from the regular officers, but he was actually vindicated in the fullness of time because in the attack on the 29th of June, all of the officers were ordered into so-called funk jackets, other ranks' tunics. So the 5th were committed to their first general engagement on the 28th of April uh, in the first of many attempts uh, to capture um, Ashi Barber and the village of Krithia. An 88th Brigade were given the pretty optimistic task of advancing five miles uphill uh, to capture the village of Krithia itself. The 5th were actually sent in as, a res as the reserve uh, to 88th Brigade where well, they very quickly found themselves in the firing line and then in, in advance of it, in what was pretty clearly a badly organized and poorly advanced uh, planned advance to contact with little by way of artillery support. The surviving accounts of the attack really belie 
sort of like the confusion and 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 really the terror of this first battle. Uh, Captain Wilson reported, um, our battalion made rapid progress and captured some trenches near Krithia. The Turks countercharged the French and we got and got back some of the captured trenches from the French, which allowed the Turks to enfilade the trenches captured by our men and they had to quit. A number of her, a number of us were hurt in the retirement. The French recovered themselves, and last night we were within 200 yards of the village. We hear reports from other parts of the field, but nothing definite. John Goat commented, "The battle raged on. Turks gradually pressing forwards, drove back the right and left flanks. We found ourselves in the centre under enfilading fire. Machine guns remained to cover the retire of the division, but at last we had to retire." We had to leave all our equipment, ammunition, micometers, et cetera, behind, threw them in the bottom of the river. Miracle how we got away. One of the lads that was left there was his good pal, Fred Tucker, that you see on the right of the screen there. Uh, he was left out there on the slopes of the hill. Fred had been serving the gun uh, with John right next to him when he was shot through the head. The assault petered out at about six o'clock and it was clear that the fifth had sustained very serious casualties. Colonel Wilson uh, was missing. The second in command, uh, Major Andrew McDonald, was terribly wounded. The RSM and uh, Captain Hepburn, the adjutant, had been killed. It was really quite sad, um, the way that Hepburn died. In trying to restrain an optimistic rush and get his men into both cover and order, he'd been killed by uh, a burst of machine gun fire. His last words were, keep your heads down, lads. And sadly, uh, Walter Hislop, the beautiful sketch that you saw of uh, the beach, that was recovered from his body too. So the uncertainty of the day is perhaps best typified by the extraordinary adventures of Colonel Wilson. Um, his uh, account is worth actually, you know, quoting in full. He said, rushing forward with a line of men, we lay down uh, and were immediately fired on by a sniper from behind at a distance of not more than 20 yards. I was wounded in the wrist by his first shot, which splintered on a rock. The second went through my arm. This must have been about 11 a.m. A fellow victim was our most excellent mess sergeant, uh, Sergeant Allsop, who lay mortally wounded uh, a few paces away. So obviously Colonel Wilson here uh, then found himself badly injured and trapped behind enemy lines as the rest of uh, the battalion uh, moved back. So he lay there for most of the day. And finally, he managed to get to his feet. Uh, he moved forward and found a Turkish soldier. He said, carefully inspecting him whilst covering him with my revolver, I, by signs, offered him money to lead me back to the British camp. Indignantly, he refused, pointing to himself and making some sign, and then to me, making a sign of the cross, uh, indicating our differences. Now, incredibly, Colonel Wilson here spent the next three days trapped behind uh, enemy lines. Uh, he was out there, uh, very badly wounded, severely dehydrated, uh, and he hid in a shell hole uh, for most of that time. So he said, uh, finally, when uh, he managed to, uh, to, to break away and get back, I, I was spotted several times, but the Turks were too busy looting bodies to come after me. The sun by this time had revived my strength, and when at least um, uh, one and a half miles away, I saw British troops moving in regular lines, Turned out that they were systematically hunting snipers. I determined to risk all and got to my feet. All went well until I was within half a mile of my uh, troops when two bullets uh, went in succession whizzed by. Experience taught me that a sniper will not fire on a dead or badly wounded man. And when the third bullet came, I fell simulating disablement in such a way as to be able to watch our men. Finally, after four hours lying there, he was able uh, to stand up. He was rescued by troops of the Essex Regiment. Uh, he got back to the hospital ship. So obviously, um, the Turks had uh, managed to hold on to Ashi Barber and they'd, um, they gained themselves a vital breathing space. So as a result of that, on the night of the 1st and 2nd of May, the defenders made their first serious attempt to try and dispossess the, uh, the allies uh, of their gains. And charging towards uh, the British lines, they suffered terrible casualties and they managed to break through a small section of uh, the Munster Fusiliers. This was a very serious situation as now essentially the only organized force where the, uh, the Ottoman forces had broken through and the beachheads 
were a few de uh, depleted companies of the exhausted fifth row Scots led by a captain. Not usually a good situation. However, what came next made the name of the fifth row Scots in the 29th division. Commanded by the completely unflappable Captain Douglas McClagan, the battalion proved themselves entirely equal to the task ahead of it. And essentially, as uh, the Ottoman forces came running down uh, towards Gully Ravine, they ran uh, into uh, and organized pl uh, two platoons of the 5th Royal Scots who simply mowed them down. All the 5th really needed to do was stay still, stay calm, and keep firing. And the 5th really here saved the day and prevented uh, an Ottoman breakthrough. Captain McLagan here modestly uh, recounted his role uh, in the fifth uh, account of holding uh, the beachhead. He said, on the 1st of May, there was a heavy attack by the Turks, about 37,000, I believe, and we had to make a night charge of our own initiative. We unfortunately didn't get all the Turks as they got behind us and fired into us, causing a lot of casualties before we got them cleared out. We got a good deal of praise from that night's work, and as a special honour, we got to hold the most difficult point in the line for the next two nights. And um, it's on that time that the Fifth Royal Scots first were mentioned in dispatches uh, for their brilliant bayonet charge, and I quote uh, Ian Hamilton there. Sadly, our eternal optimist Douglas Lindsay and our medical student Monty Smith didn't answer the roll call after the action. It's quite sad. So despite the fifth being the heroes of the hour, there was very little rest for them because again, on uh, the uh, 6th of May, the assault on Ashi Barber was renewed. By this point, the two companies that had been down on the beach had been brought up to the firing line. And um, what came here on the 6th, 7th, 8th of May was possibly the best opportunity, could be debated, that the British forces had of breaking through the Turkish lines capturing Ashi Barber and capturing the village of Prithia. You would therefore think that the plan would have been a little, you know, would, would have essentially been warmed over, but essentially it was just a repeat of uh, what they'd been given on the 28th of April, essentially get up the hill, capture the village, and then dig in. Uh, Colonel Wilson, uh, although he was absent from the attack, um, through his wounds, he gave a very accurate summation of uh, his opinions of Hunter Bunter's planning. He wrote, none of Hunter Weston's orders were ever intelligible and always had to be changed, modified or ignored. He could never give a definite objective for an attack, but would end every order with go as far as you can and then entrench. And Wilson, who would later lead a brigade, certainly had a point. The preliminary bombardment was again practically non-existent. The attack went in on the 11, uh, at 11 o'clock on the 6th of May and very quickly became disorganized like uh, the 28th of April. The Royal Scots history says that the 5th uh, Royal Scots, again as reserves, were not involved until the attack had broken down. They were forced to scramble across uh, open ground and take over the firing line at 8 p.m. And essentially, the trenches that they uh, took over were completely um, unfit for purpose. So it's not very surprising, therefore, that acting uh, commanding officer, Captain John McIntosh, who was a Scottish in, uh, international uh, athletics uh, com competitor, was killed by a sniper. And uh, Captain McClagan, who took over the battalion again, said that he actually fell to the ground dead without making a single noise or uttering a sound. So on the 7th of May at 10 o'clock, um, the 5th Royal Scots, clearly learning on the job uh, from their experiences on the 28th of April, advanced in short, well-covered rushes uh, into the daisy patch and by sheer determination forced their way into the southernmost points of Fir Tree Wood. And there they held on for seven hours in the face of truly eye-watering casualties. Absolutely terrible. John Goat, our machine gunner, uh, who was who was very badly wounded that day and was actually um, uh, evacuated, said, Fifth Royal Scots went forward under murderous fire to take a pine wood. Took it, but no support, so had to retire again. Awful slaughter. Held the trench till night. Dublin and Munster Fusiliers then came up, and wood was taken again. Our Maxims wrought havoc. Had a busy time belt filling. Dante's Inferno had nothing like this.
I think they want to wipe out the Fifth Royal Scots. Desperate for artillery support, uh, young bugler David Hall volunteered to run messages to the rear and in the process basically received what was practically a direct hit from a Turkish shell. He was blown up into the air uh, with such force that his, his uniform and his webbing was blasted off his body. But somehow he leapt to his feet, struggled forward with his message, with the fifth cheering him on. He was immediately awarded the DCM for this incredible performance. So at five o'clock with McClagan realising that further resistance was, was simply going to be a waste of life, the battalion executed a fine fighting withdrawal uh, under his hand. Uh, he said, um, essentially, they've gone through hell, we broke through the wood, we haven't got it yet. And there's that real sense of sadness and disappointment. But one thing is to be said here, that even though uh, McClagan had shown incredible bravery in the attack, he'd shown an awful lot of moral courage in acknowledging that there were limits to what flesh and blood had done. And he actually pulled the Fifth Royal Scots out of uh, the wood that afternoon. They'd gone in 600 men strong. They were practically, um, there weren't enough really to fill two companies by the time that they came out of the wood that night. He then had the terrible duty of having to inform relatives at home of what had happened, but there were now not enough officers and NCOs to write the customary letters home. So he actually had to put a letter in the Scotsman, an open letter to people's families. He says, as temporary commanding officer of the first line Fifth Royal Scots, I feel it my duty uh, to write some news to the relatives of those of our men who have nobly fallen in their country during the last 19 days. This is a duty which ordinarily falls on the officers commanding the companies to which the individual men are attached, and personal letters are due to the relatives of each. Unfortunately, the available combatant officers are so small in numbers at present that it is quite impossible to take on such a duty so much as we would desire it. Mem uh, so many of our gallant men have fallen that it would be absolutely heartbreaking if one did not realise that in doing so, each and all had sustained the highest traditions of the British Army and earned the sincere approbation of senior officers commanding. The regimental history flatly concluded that the terrible truth could no longer be evaded that our plans to capture Krithia and Ashibaba had collapsed like a house of cards. The next major attack was, of course, the attack on the 4th of June. Thankfully, uh, the 5th Royal Scots were, uh, were in reserve for this one and weren't actively engaged uh, in the attack. But of course, uh, in order to disrupt the lines, um, the uh, Ottoman artillery heavily bombarded uh, the reserve trenches that the 5th Royal Scots were in. And Captain Arthur Muir um, left a very, very moving account of what happened to him there. Essentially, uh, he'd been sitting in a frontline trench, and then for whatever reason, he decided to just get up and take a walk. So he clambered out of the trench when a Turkish shell struck the exact position that he'd been in. And he recalled the moment like this. I remember that I stumbled a bit as I walked on, thinking that if I'd stayed where I was or, or gone the other way, I should by now have been blown to little bits. I met one of my orderlies who, fortunately for him, had left immediately with the first message I had written, the bits of shrapnel in his jaw, in his elbow, and in his back. I bound him up and I packed him off. I got back into the trench and saw what I had not seen before. The smoke had now cleared. My other orderly lay dead, my message still in his hand. His body and head lay four or five feet apart. Two of my signals were killed also and mutilated so horribly that to describe their, uh, their condition would be inexcusable. So some small glimmer of hope for the fifth was the heartening news that the 52nd Lowland Division would be sent not to France, but to Gallipoli. And so the fifth would be joined by the fourth and the seventh Royal Scots. It's certainly well known that the 7th Leith Battalion on their outwards journey uh, met with a terrible rail disaster, which is essentially uh, an hour long lecture in itself uh, at Gretna Green, just as they were crossing uh, the border into England. Negligent, uh, negligent signaling uh, had left a train uh, stationary on the track. The Royal Scots careered into that 
the, uh, the wreckage jackknifed over the upline and to put no finer point on it in the blink of an eye, uh, most of the men from A and D Company had been killed. We see there a picture there of their Colonel, uh, Colonel Peebles, um, taking a roll call in the front line, uh, in, in one of the fields, rather, before they uh, reached the uh, front line. The 4th Battalion of the Royal Scots actually suffered their own disaster. They were steaming uh, towards uh, the peninsula in uh, the troop ship Reindeer, when in the darkness they rammed into the hospital ship Inningham, striking the ship absolutely amidships, and it looked like uh, both of the ships would sink. Um, the Padre of the Fourth, William Ewing, takes up the story. He said about midnight there was a terrific crash. The first thought was of torpedoes, the next of mines. The reindeer had been rammed there, uh, had rammed another vessel, striking her amidships. There was a moment of desperate anxiety, but perfect discipline was observed. The 52nd Lowland Division relates the reaction of the 4th to the situation under the steady hand of its colonel, spotters were done. Uh, it says very quietly, they stayed where they were, took off their equipment, boots and puttees. The small steamers did not carry life belts for the crowded human freight they ferried to Gallipoli, but many of the Royal Scots emptied their water bottles in order to have a little extra buoyancy when they were trying to keep afloat. Thankfully, reindeer managed to uh, limp to port, and the 4th Battalion were mentioned in dispatches by Ian, by Ian Hamilton before they'd actually got into, uh, into combat. Both their uh, battalions, uh, the 4th and 7th, were in the trench lines in June, and they very quickly uh, made their worth felt. For, of course, our prize shot, Sergeant Dewar, uh, arrived with the 4th Royal Scots as well. The 4th were being pestered by a sniper at this point, and Dewar was sent out to deal with it. Uh, the Edinburgh Evening News says, at, uh, at length, the sniper showed a little of his head. The sergeant fired, and to use the language of the range, scored a central bull. So it was on the evening of the 18th of June that the Turkish troops again tried another night attack uh, to try and break through uh, the lines of um, the, the British forces. And they managed to do this again, uh, establishing themselves to the right rear of the Royal Scots. The next morning, the 19th of June, Colonel Wilson led an extremely determined counterattack, very meticulously planned, um, very neat in its uh, objectives and its scope, which forced the Turkish troops out of their uh, out of the British positions. And as they uh, fled back across no man's land, they were caught by the machine gunners of the Fifth Royal Scots, uh, who mowed them down. And it was here that Colonel Wilson even though uh, the, the, the war diary says that he looked far from well on his return from his wound, was finally awarded a DSO. Ian Hamilton saying that this was as much for the 5th Royal Scots as it was uh, for um, uh, Wilson himself. So, in order to, uh, to concentrate and to, to uh, capitalise on the advances that the French troops had made on the 21st of June, the 4th, 5th and 7th Royal Scots uh, were to be sent into action in their climactic battle uh, on the 28th of June, uh, the Battle of Gully Ravine. And as I said, the casualties uh, suffered that day were truly eye-watering. A lot went wrong before this battle. The idea basically being that 87 Brigade or, um, of uh, the 29th Division would attack on the left-hand side of Gully Ravine and um, 156 Brigade of 52nd Lowland Division would attack on the right-hand side. But as I said, there was real trouble before, the, uh, before this battle took place. Uh, the events of 27th of June were not happy. In a stormy conference, uh, Colonel Peebles, uh, the, the Colonel of the Sevens that you see here, expressed his disgust and contempt at the primitive maps that he'd been given and the fact that none of his officers would be able to have time to familiarise themselves with the ground over which they were to attack that very next morning. Uh, Spottiswood Dunn's 4th Battalion would have to advance into no man's land and then swing half right but they weren't even allowed to take these primitive maps into the front line with them. Uh, they've been told that the artillery preparation will be equally divided between the left and right-hand side of Gully Ravine 
but it was there the night before the attack that they found out that the entirety of the artillery fire would be fired uh, on the, the trenches to be attacked by um, the 87th Brigade. So essentially, the fifth, uh, the the fourth and seventh Royal Scots will be going in to attack with no other support than that which came from their own machine guns, and the orders came through extremely late. So it was only at half past six on the morning of the assault that everybody was in the right position, thoroughly exhausted and completely dehydrated. So of course, um, when 87 Brigade went over the top to attack their trenches. The Ottoman artillery quickly apprehended what was going on and started blasting artillery fire into the packed trenches that the 4th uh, and 7th Royal Scots were in. A member of the 4th, uh, writing in hospital in Malta, stated, We stood to arms all that night and the fight, uh, the fight started at 8 o'clock in the morning. The Turks were not idle and many of our trenches were blown in and men were killed and wounded before they even saw a Turk. One of the casualties uh, was Major James Henderson, who was actually commanding the assault of the 4th Royal Scots that morning. His legs were smashed by uh, a Turkish shell as he waited to go over the top. To those um, that went to Major Henderson's assistance, he actually said, I'm finished. Never mind me, attend to the men. And the private soldier who reported these words added, he was a splendid soldier and a proper tough. So at 11 a.m. sharp, the 4th Royal Scots went into action. One of the first to fall on the very parapet was Colonel Dunn. Even though he was mortally wounded, he roared, go on, Queens! And the first couple of lines of enemy trenches were carried in a couple of minutes. Then, to the horror of the 4th Royal Scots, they realized that there were two trenches hidden behind uh, the Turkish lines that they'd been sent to attack that they just didn't know about. Um, Major Ewing, the Padre, uh, relates, although taken by surprise, the gallant terriers did not hesitate or flinch. Captain George McRae, uh, this man was the son of Sir George McRae, who founded the famous uh, football battalion, the McRae's Battalion, immediately took command of the situation. And his final words were, do you see that trench there? Well, we, they have got to be put out of that. Come on, boys. Over they went, and as they neared the parapet, Captain McRae received a bullet through the head. This trench was full of Turks who did not wait until the Royals got in, but very few escaped. So on the left of the attack, um, the 4th Royal Scots had managed to get into the Ottoman trenches, but at terrible cost. In the centre, the 7th Battalion actually managed to get into the Turkish front lines with very little um, casualties at all. Second Lieutenant David Lyle uh, took his men over the bags that morning and uh, he shouted, come on, and we went over the parapet, the whole company like one man. We were about 150 uh, yards to the first trench to take that and about 250 yards to the next one. The initial attack was attended with very few casualties. However, as I said, William Begbie was to witness what was to happen next. After a short halt, during which the supporting wave closed up, the advance on the final objective was begun. By this time, the Turks, having recovered from their panic, delivered such a terrific fire that our company fell in bundles. So again, the attack had succeeded, but at a terrible cost. And it really only succeeded as well as it had done because of the fire from the 4th and 7th machine gunners. And to give you an idea of, um, of uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the quality of the supporting fire here. Frank McKenzie, the chap that you see on the screen there, was actually sniped through the throat, but managed to keep his machine guns in action. On the right-hand side of the line, the Cameronians were, the, were, were essentially completely destroyed. So the fifth Royal Scots, who were again in reserve, were brought up and uh, they were then sent into action. But by the end of the day, the fifth Royal Scots had simply ceased to exist as uh, a fighting unit. The fourth and seventh Royal Scots had to be uh, amalgamated under the command of uh, Colonel Peebles. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible day, but they had succeeded in capturing their objectives with no artillery preparation before them. So the final uh, sacrifice of the fifth Royal Scots was their part in uh, the Suvla landings uh, in August. 
But the only thing that they succeeded really there was losing their acting commanding officer, who I'll, I'll tell you about in a little moment. It was a bit of a disaster from here on uh, for our, our lads in the, uh, the, the 4th and 7th Royal Scots. They were amalgamated into one battalion. And Colonel Peeble, describing the officers and men that he lost, he mentioned their many years of volunteer and territorial service, that they'd all shown exceptional interest and keenness in their work. He closed by simply stating, all were sadly missed. Two of the slain that day were Lieutenant Francis uh, Thompson and his younger brother, Eric, the two lads that you see here, two brothers that were killed next to each other. Major Arthur Sanderson that you see on the left of the screen there was Colonel Peebles' best friend from school. And the chap that you see on the right of the screen there was John Peebles, his younger brother. He'd actually had to command his own best friend and his own younger brother over the top into action and both were killed. Absolutely terrible. So the 4th and 7th hung on uh, until uh, November when they actually took part in a very successful attack on the 15th of November. But by that point, it was clear that the game was bogey. And indeed, uh, Colonel Peebles was one of the last men to step off uh, the, uh, the peninsula when uh, the, the 7th Royal Scots were evacuated as the rear guard of the 52nd Lowland Division. As uh, it, was, it was lugubriously named in one of the Edinburgh papers, a brilliant tactical advance backwards to Egypt. There is but one odd postscript to this uh, story that I'll close with. On the 10th of uh, uh, August, uh, that old war horse Colonel uh, Wilson was promoted to be a brigadier and command of the 5th Royal Scots uh, passed to the chap that you can see there, uh, Major Alexander White. Uh, he's obviously a captain in the picture there. He only lasted as the acting CO for 10 days when he was mortally wounded at Suvla. He died on uh, the hospital ship SS Arcadian. But bizarrely enough, and we've never been able to get to the bottom of this, even though he died at sea, his body was repatriated to Edinburgh. Now, Major White there was uh, a well-known Edinburgh solicitor. He left uh, a personal fortune in today's money of over £750,000 and a house worth £2.7 million in today's money. Whether that had anything to do with things, I'm not quite sure, but his body was brought back to Edinburgh. So here in Edinburgh, we do have a Gallipoli veteran who is buried under a Commonwealth War Graves headstone, but... We're not quite sure why he has a Gallipoli-style marker rather than one of the other more common, uh, common Commonwealth War Graves headstones. So to this day, and this stone was only put there relatively recently, we do not know how this man managed to make his way back from Gallipoli to be repatriated and buried in Edinburgh. And even now, I do not know why he is the only casualty seemingly in Edinburgh with a Gallipoli headstone, a Gallipoli style headstone. But one thing I do know, his uh, funeral was attended by hundreds of grieving relatives who used his grave as a shrine to their fallen relatives. And Captain Muir and Captain McClargan, who again had been wounded and uh, had been brought back to Edinburgh, they were two of his pallbearers and they were able to lay his remains back in the native soil of Edinburgh, which was a fate that had been denied to so many others of the 4th, 5th and 7th Royal Scots. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>